All right, we've got 2 Kings chapter 20. In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. It's a tough word to get right there. Verse 2. Then he, which is Hezekiah, turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech you, how I have walked before you in truth and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Before Isaiah had gone out of the middle, of, middle court, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Return and say to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, Thus says the Lord, the God of your father David, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord. I will add fifteen years to your life, and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. Then Isaiah said, Take a cake of figs. And they took and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. All right, so passages like this one beg the question from people, does God change his mind? Which is a totally fair question to ask. All right, so there are two important considerations involving passages where it appears that God changes his mind. First of all, we can say statements such as, the Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, that we find in Genesis chapter 6, to be examples of a term called an anthropopathism. An anthropopathism is a figure of speech in which the feelings or thought processes of finite humanity are ascribed to the infinite God. It's a way to help us understand God's work from a human perspective. Secondly, we must make a distinction between conditional declarations of God and unconditional determinations of God. An example we'll eventually get to is when God says, I will destroy Nineveh in 40 days. He was speaking conditionally with the Assyrians' response. And we know this because the Assyrians repented and God did not. God did not change his mind. Rather, his message to Nineveh was a warning meant to provoke repentance. And his warning was successful. I believe Hezekiah's response in our chapter today is an example of a conditional declaration from God. Um, an example of an unconditional declaration of God is the Lord's promise to David. He said, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And we see that in 2 Samuel chapter 7. There is no uh, qualification expressed or implied in this declaration. No matter what David did or did not do, the word of the Lord would come to pass in this situation. The fact that God changes his treatment of us in response to our choices has nothing to do with his character, and that's something important to point out. His character does not change. He is unchanging in his nature, his plan, and his being. In our example today, I believe he foreknew the response Hezekiah would give, and his action was a reward of Hezekiah's faithfulness to him. It's also entirely possible, and in my opinion the truth, that God did instruct Isaiah to deliver that message to Hezekiah, knowing it would be a test of his faith. In no way does that make Isaiah a false prophet at all. He was just responding to what the Lord told him. Okay, back to verse 8. Now Hezekiah said to Isaiah, What will be the sign that the Lord will heal me, and that I shall go up to the house of the Lord the third day? Isaiah said, This shall be the sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward ten steps, or go back ten steps? So Hezekiah answered, it is easy for the shadow to decline 10 steps. No, but let the shadow turn backward 10 steps. Isaiah the prophet cried to the Lord, and he brought the shadow on the stairway back 10 steps by which it had gone down on the stairway of Ahaz. So basically, this was like a spring forward type thing going on here, where there was a supernatural interruption of pushing time forward. Kind of like the miracle we read about in Joshua chapter 10 when the sun stopped. Verse 12. At that time, Barodak Baladan, a son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters in a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Hezekiah listened to them and showed them all his treasure house, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious oil and the house of his armor and all that was found in his treasuries. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, what did these men say, and from where have they come to you? And Hezekiah said, They have come from a, from a far country, from Babylon. He, Isaiah, said, What have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, They have seen all that is in my house, 
There is nothing among my treasuries that I have not shown them. All right. Up until this point in his life, we've seen that Hezekiah has been a pretty faithful and godly king. However, he was still a human being, and this was a prideful moment of weakness in his life that we'll see will have consequences. Verse 16, Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in store to this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Some of your sons who shall issue from you, whom you will beget, will be taken away, and they will become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he thought, Is it not so, if there will be peace and truth in my days? All right, Hezekiah's response reaffirms Isaiah as God's faithful messenger, as well as God's goodness in not destroying Jerusalem during Hezekiah's lifetime. Hezekiah's reaction may have been his way of looking for some type of silver lining to lighten the gloomy fate that was coming for his descendants. Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and all his might, and how he made the pool and the conduit and brought water into the city, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? So Hezekiah slept with his fathers, and Manasseh, his son, became king in his place. And that will do it for the chapter today. Thank you guys very much for being here. Uh, Lord willing, we'll be back at it tomorrow. God bless you, and have a great day. Take care.